What is going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. We've got, uh, like I say all the time, we've got a fun topic to talk about today. And this one, legitimately to me, is actually one of the more fun things uh, about the S5 Mark II. And that's obviously, as the title says, real-time LUT. And for those that don't know, you know, kind of what the heck are LUTs? And we're going to be talking a lot about that. If you're someone who is... You know, highly experienced in video editing and uh, the video aspect of utilization for LUTs. This will probably be a little bit lower level of, you know, kind of coverage than what you probably would be expecting. Because we're going to focus primarily on my actual S5 Mark II and how this system works, what it does. We're going to do a brief overview about LUTs, what they are, um, and really kind of talk about the bridge between photographers and videographers in how you can utilize LUTs. Because I think a lot of photographers out there, you may not really think about LUTs or you may look at them at face value and say, okay, those look way more complicated than what I want. I would just use a preset in like Lightroom or Photoshop or something like that. But we're going to, uh, I'm going to do my best to demystify some of that for everybody. Uh, and we're going to go in and show some cool demos. Uh, I got a couple websites up that we're going to take a look at as well. Uh, but yeah, these are the Lumix live streams. We do these every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and they're for you, the community, to be able to reach out to us, talk to Panasonic Lumix. So, uh, since that's who I am, I work for Panasonic Lumix. Uh, and, and, and get questions answered. So in this case, you know, obviously we're talking about looks, uh, lookup tables, LUTs. Uh, and the kind of concepts behind that, but don't feel that you can't ask any other questions. Um, we may not be able to get to them all during this broadcast, but if you drop your question in the chat, it helps us build this, uh, content for, you know, maybe next week's stream or the week after that kind of thing. So feel free to tag us with at Lumix USA in the chat for the questions. Uh, listening to the feedback from everyone last week, we're not going to be using the Q&A thing that YouTube has be, uh, built in since that seemed to be uh, not necessarily the most streamlined way to, to handle questions, especially because those questions don't show up afterwards anymore, as I noticed. Uh, so yeah, if you have a question, tag at Lumix uh, USA in the chat and we'll be able to get through it. Um... Let me see here. Uh, before I jump into that, I want to remind everybody about Lumix Pro Services. We have, Lumi uh, we have the LPS program here in the U.S., uh, and we have it available in a number of other regions as well. Uh, in the U.S., we have the Red and the Platinum tier. Red is free if you've just bought a Lumix camera and you're in the U.S., especially if you just bought um, you know, like the S5 Mark II, uh, or if you've got an S5 Mark II X on pre-order. Uh, make sure to keep an eye on uh, Lumix Pro Services. Uh, the red tier is free. It gets you your three-year manufacturer warranty. So that's on top of the one year that we offer. Uh, you also get some, basically the, the platform, if you ever do need service, you can go through that. Uh, but if you're someone who likes to have like that extra level of service and support on the back end, we do offer the platinum tier, which is a paid service. Uh, this gets you that three-year warranty. You get um, two-day repairs with next day shipping both ways. You get 20% off out of warranty repairs. So if something drops or is broken like that, um, you make sure that you can get yourself registered on there. Uh, you also get annual sensor cleanings, EVF cleanings, lens calibrations, firmware updates if you're someone who doesn't like to do that stuff on your own, uh, as well as an exclusive member hop line. So if you are like me, you prefer actually speaking to a person instead of a chat or an email thread, uh, you do have the option to be able to access that. Um, now... Uh, for anyone in the U.S. that's registering on LPS, know that we've had a pretty big inundation of new registrations. So if you are registering, um, especially around a new camera launch, um, some of the lead times may be a little bit longer to get your welcome kit. Um, but as long as you have that email that everything's been in and submitted, uh, just make sure you have all your documentation in and uh, you should be good to go from there. Uh, let's see uh, what we've got in the chat so far before we jump in. Um... Looking forward to the stream as well as CP Plus on February 23rd. Yeah, uh, CP Plus is one of those shows I wish I was able to be part of, but since it's in Japan, unfortunately, I don't get to be part of that one. Um, I get to be part of CES and NAB, which for those that follow us and are going to be at NAB, we will be at NAB this year. Uh, we will be, just like last year, part of the Panasonic Connect booth. So that is our broadcast uh, PTZ kind of division. 
Uh, so make sure to follow up with NAB. If you're going to be there, let us know. I believe Matt and I are both going to be there, but we'll we'll have more info as we get closer to that. Uh, but yeah, CP Plus is starting soon. Um, should be a really cool show. Uh, so if you're in Japan and you are uh, going to be at the show, make sure to swing by the Panasonic booth. I uh, hope to hear about some uh, grading ProRes RAW using LUTs. Is it, uh, is it correct uh, to use standard Vericam LUTs in PQ Timeline with Premiere? Um, we'll touch a little bit on that. Um, I'm not the best at the actual grading side of video uh, editing. Um, what I plan to do is I want to have some more uh, topics like this and actually have some experts come in. So maybe... Uh, Maybe we can have Nick Driftwood come on um, if Nick is here in the chat. I know sometimes he drops in. That would be an awesome thing to have Nick uh, join us. Or we'll have Matt, maybe some other colorists come in and join us. Uh, hope to buy an S5 Mark II later. And one of the features uh, that seems great is real-time LUT. Hoping for an interesting live stream. Well, I hope it is interesting for you. Uh, it's definitely interesting to me. Uh, let's see here. Uh, <laughs> loving the jitter-free vid video after escaping the S brand. Love how I can use LUTs and post or same LUT in the camera if you want quick results. It's really a winning feature. Yep, we love it. Uh, I believe it was last September registered so far. Nothing. Uh, I'm not, I, I can't even try to pronounce that name. I think it's uh, Leolier, maybe. Um, you can always reach out to uh, either the email address that uh, the Lumix Pro Services has uh, for it, uh, or you can reach out to our standard service department and they can push to see if there's if there was missing information, uh, if an email's lost in uh, spam or any anything along those lines. They can definitely check on that stuff for you. But, all right, so let's kind of start the stream with kind of a brief overview, right? Like, what are LUTs? Um, for those that are working in the video space, you already know what LUTs are for the most part, right? These are, uh, it's, it's a shortened way to say look up table. So basically you're taking a known value of colors and you are converting them to something else. So it says, if I see red, interpret red as say orange, right? That's what a LUT does, but it does it on a grand scale. And there is a lot of different types of LUTs to use that we're not really going to go too far into on this stream for this particular topic. Uh, but there are different LUTs. There's previewing LUTs, there's editing LUTs, there's speed LUTs, there's all of these different levels, and you would use them in different kind of scenarios, depending on what it is that you're trying to do. So I have uh, here, uh, let us go to my screen here. So I have here a, um, a couple articles that I've pulled up from a couple different places that are uh, pretty, pretty solid tools, uh, for you. If you're looking at, you know, trying to understand some of this, if you're just getting into this kind of workflow and working with either log or as we're going to talk about a little bit later, working with actually the standard profiles and using LUTs in a slightly different way than a videographer would. So when you start looking at this, um, there's a big misconception out there that a LUT is basically a magic bullet for taking log footage and making it, you know, an end result so that you, that you can deliver. And the reason that's kind of come up, I think, is because of the mis misunderstanding of what a LUT is designed for, wh when and why you should use them, right? Basic LUTs can be used for things like normalization. So taking V-Log and conforming it to, say, 709, but correcting colors so that they are, when you look at a chip chart, accurate colors based off a chip chart. There are also different kinds of setups where, you know, you may be thinking of a LUT, but actually thinking more of a look and not an actual like technical LUT. These are the different kinds of things that you want to kind of pay attention to. For our purposes today, we're going to be kind of leaning more into the more creative side of what LUTs do. So not necessarily talking about making technical, uh, you know, technical LUTs or making things that are designed to conform color spaces or stuff like that. Though I have some cool stuff to talk about that uh, with real-time LUT in a minute. Uh, so in, in the video side, when you want to actually do some of your grading, so say you're past that point, you've already got the footage to be normalized the way you want. So you've put, say, a 709 LUT on this, and you've brought it into a Rec. 709 color space. You also have the ability to apply a LUT or a look that 
can conform or change the way that image looks based on, you know, film stocks, based on, you know, the, the orange and teal stuff that video users work with. All of these different kinds of things are, are what allow you to do this. And they're designed to be a very fast, rapid way to do this, where you're not going to be manually going in and tweaking every little color to re-represent something else. Uh, when it comes to photography, we do this, and for the most part, we don't realize that we're doing this. This is what, you know, all of those things that you see in Lightroom and Photoshop and Capture One and all those companies, these are basically what are called presets that you see, where they're already, they're edits that are already done that when you apply it onto an image, you then just have to maybe tweak it a little bit for your level of contrast or exposure, things like that. And it's kind of a pre you know, kind of finished way to edit. So what's cool about the S5 Mark II is that we've bridged the ability to use these LUTs or lookup tables in a way that is super beneficial for both photographers and videographers. It's one system and one bank of these that you can just be jumping through to say, hey, you know, for this particular scene, I want to use this look because that's how I want it to go. Up until recently, if you were using a Lumix camera, you would be using these as view assists. Now that means that the footage that you're getting out onto your computer is, is still going to be in vlog, if we're thinking video space. It would still be in vlog, but you'd be able to at least preview roughly what that image is going to look like after I apply my look to it. So you can judge kind of your exposure off of that. Your tools would, would actually react to how the LUTs were applied. So if you put a uh, V-Log to 709, you'll notice that your waveform actually changes when you have that on so that you know, okay, hey, I'm exposing and I want to maximize my brightness for 709 or my brightness for Rec 2020. That's, that still is there, but the difference is with real-time LUT and the My Photo Styles option, you now have the ability to actually bake these looks into the footage if that's how your workflow wants to go. Now, I'll put a big caveat on this is that not everybody's going to want to use real-time LUT in that way because in some cases, you still want the log footage as your actual final end result that you're working with on the computer. And in that case, we still have the V-Log um, view assist tools in the camera. So I think from here, let's actually take a look at my camera and we'll kind of go through what what this is, how it works, um, and and just kind of the, the basics of it. So to start with, you'll see that on the S5 Mark II, you have a couple new options for uh, the storage of LUTs as well as actually accessing these looks, right? So I'm going to use the actual main menu option for this, and I'll show you some other cool ways that you can get into this later. So first off, you'll see we're in photo styles. So with photo styles, Traditionally, if you wanted to shoot in log, you went to V-Log, and you'll notice that you have some sharpness and noise reduction control on V-Log, but for the vast majority of everything else, these are all blocked out because V-Log is, a, is there's basically minimal noise reduction applied to it, sharpening, and all that kind of look is designed to be very specific. So when you're in V-Log, this allows me to also use tools like Luminant Spot Meter, where I can have this camera set up to say, Okay, right now, I have this box on this gray card, and this gray card is measuring at zero stops. That means that my middle gray is properly exposed based on what V-Log is designed for, which would be 42 IRE. And now I can say my highlight regions in this particular image, we'll see if I go all the way up to here, you'll see that it's going to be at, again, it's zero stops. If I go into the Sigma 60 to 600 that I have sitting here, You'll see that this is underexposed by 4.3 stops. If I go to this white card, I can come in and say, hey, you know, how, how bright is this white card roughly than the other? And it's only 0.2 stops over. This allows me to come in when I don't have, you know, waveforms out over HDMI. I can come in here and I can start adjusting my exposures. So I'll put this to 180 and we'll start adjusting the uh, aperture here to bring it up to where... Let's say I want to have this overexposed by about two stops. So we are at plus 1.8 stops. So as we're, you know, kind of looking at this, 
I can now say, okay, cool, V-Log, I've got my basic exposure, I know that, you know, my highlights are going to have more than enough room in them, cool. But if you don't want to go through this process and you want to be able to take that log footage and know a look that you always apply to your footage, this is where we've added real-time LUT. So if I come in here and I change this to real-time LUT, you'll see that for one, it's still based in V-Log. But I have the ability to come in here and select a LUT that I want to put on top of this. Now by default, if I go up to the top here, you'll see Rec. 709. So now I have an, a V-logged file that is going to have a Rec. 709. This is the Panasonic Rec. 709 log file that is just overlaid on top of this. Now, you also have the ability that when you're in standby, I can program a button here. If I press and hold the right arrow, you'll see that we now have an apply LUT option as well. So this means that I can toggle back and forth between this and say, okay, I can see there's my log footage. That's it with a 709 conversion put on it. And if I have my luminance spot meter open here, you'll see that it's plus, um, if I go into log, it's plus two stops over. And if I go into the like 709 conversion, it's 3.5 stops over. So this shows me where that actual look is going to be changed. So this makes it super, super easy that if you already know a look, you know how you want to have this stuff going, you can set your exposure up, throw your LUT on it, and still be able to use a tool like luminance spot meter to determine, well, where are my highlights and shadows? If I'm looking at the lens here, it's about underexposed by around three stops. If I come in here and I go to the, the um, Steam Deck screen here, you'll see this is going to be down under eight stops. And then if I come up here and go to that white-ish piece of paper, we'll see that this is going to be plus four stops. That's over four stops. But what's cool is that on the Lumix cameras, you do also have the ability that the, there is a lot more range that you have for exposure when you're in V-Log. So this lets me go in there and say, hey, you know, I, I know that I have six and a half stops or roughly six and a half stops over middle gray that I can expose to and know that my highlights are not going to be blown technically from the log footage. But if you do it in this way, you want to make sure that you kind of keep, keep in mind where that is. And like I said, when you're in the... Um, real-time LUT functionality, you can toggle this on and off as long as you're in standby. Once you're recording, it's going to stay, you know, whichever one you started the recording with. But I have the ability to come in here, toggle these on and off and say, okay, you know, for this one, I just want to have it on for, for this particular look. So basics here, remember that real-time LUT, the actual color profile is baking in the look to the footage. But if you're a video shooter, there's actually a really cool thing that you can do with this that was brought to our attention. I see uh, Matt, Matt Fraser's in the chat, which is awesome, and I see Nick's here. But what's super, super cool about this is that I can also take our vlog footage, go into real-time LUT, and I can change some of these to a different camera's kind of uh, look for that. You can do this by outputting those different looks or those different log footages uh, right from things like uh, Resolve and programs like that. So if I come in here and I say, hey, you know, I want to use this one, um, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I can now have my camera set so that I am recording in log, but I'm recording in a log that's been uh, basically transcribed to the rest of maybe the cameras that you're working with on set. So when you go to color grade later, and you go into post with this, now the footage is going to actually grade and respond very close to maybe the A cam that you're using on set. So now, while yes, V-Log is going to give you more flexibility if you were to use V-Log, that's not always a reality. And in some cases, you're using this camera as a you know B or C cam to maybe your A cam production, but you want to be able to have a streamlined workflow for post-production well, just take our camera that's going to give you all the tools, the 6K open gate, all the, the fun features that we have in our camera. This is going to give you that ability to match your cameras even better than you could before. Vlog itself is incredibly flexible to match with other systems, but now you've got a, a, a possibility to just come in here and say, I just want to have this much easier to just write out a camera, drop it into the editing bay, and cool, there we go. That's, that's my look. It's all set. Um, let us take a look at some of the questions that came in here. Um, looks like Matt, you're answering the question from Ruckus, which looks good. Christian, uh, Christian says for pictures, if I have a LUT, 
that was made for video, do I have to take in vlog picture profile for the same results or will that be automatic? Uh, so this is actually a really good uh, question, re really good point to kind of keep in mind. Um, if you're using LUTs that were designed for vlog, right, you are going to want to set the camera up in vlog because that, that lookup table is designed to take the color profile that is vlog and vgamut and convert it to a style. Now, you can, of course, put LUTs on pretty much anything, but your results are never going to be what they were designed for because red in vlog is interpreted as this particular data point, where red in standard may be this particular data point, and that won't match right, because that throws the entire, you know, kind of layout off. All a lookup table is, again, is saying this point, interpret it as this point. That's the, that's the whole purpose of a, a LUT, basically. For photography, there are some cool things you can do with LUTs, especially if you're someone who works in the Photoshop, uh, you know, kind of ecosystem, if you use Adobe Camera Raw or Photoshop or Lightroom, stuff like that. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a minute because it, it changes the way you can use these and what it is that you can actually create with your camera by using LUTs like this. So, uh, let's go, uh, let's see the next question here. Um, that's when I'm using vlog, uh, just got my S5 Mark II, February 1st, <laughs> phase detect hybrid autofocus is wonderful, awesome. Uh, Dave, when editing vlog footage, is it better to do any white balance corrections before applying the LUT or after or both? Uh, I am a firm believer of you should be checking, uh, your white balance and making sure that you're on point in almost any scenario that you're going to go with. Uh, if you're using uh, LUTs as a preview and not baking it in, you're going to want to make sure that your white balance is set correct on the log footage. So with log, do your white balance, make sure that you're, you're correct there. And then you can put your preview LUT on there and you'll see it. Uh, if you're using real-time LUT, make sure that you're doing your white balance with real-time LUT applied because that is the actual footage that you're recording. Um, even when you're using things like uh, uh, real-time LUT or any of these things, it's still always a good habit to just make sure that you're checking your white balance. Uh, the S5 Mark II does have the function where it can lock white balance now if you're using auto white balance. Uh, but typically, you're going to want to make sure that you're on top of it, making sure that throughout the chain as light changes, things like that, that you're still set. A lot of times in cases like this, you'll see that a lot of people would be using just the Kelvin scale, um, because you're going to be light metering and things like that for actual color temperature. Uh, and that, that can be an easy way because that's a constant that's not going to change. Where if you use auto white balance or any of the auto white balances, they're going to vary over time. Uh, because they, they take information in unless you lock that white balance at the beginning of your recording. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, is it possible to tether the base S5 Mark II to a tablet or iPad with USB-C on the current firmware and current Lumix Sync app? Um, this is actually something Matt Fraser and I were testing through. Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, at this time, uh, there is no USB tethering to the Sync app. Um, I do not know if the S5 Mark II will get that support. Um, the S5 Mark II X and cameras like the GH5 Mark II uh, have that functionality because they have the wireless streaming functionality. Um, so yeah, I'm not hundred percent sure if the S5 Mark II is going to get that function. Um, Harry or Harry, I, I'm just going to say Harry. Uh, hi Sean, could you please show us how to generate your own LUTs in Lightroom or Photoshop and how to apply those LUTs onto the S5 Mark II? I am so glad that you've asked that. So let's actually move to the next uh, kind of part here. And, um, as we can see, we've got Matt in the chat. So definitely just feel free to keep uh, asking questions. I know Matt's doing a great job uh, supporting uh, Lumix Live on this. So here we are looking in Photoshop. So this is uh, these are a couple images that I took when we were out in Tokyo. Um, and these are with the S5 Mark II, and these were raw files converted to 16-bit TIFFs using the Silky Pick software that comes for free with the S5 Mark II uh, while we're waiting for Adobe's raw software to be supported. So if you're someone that wants to utilize real-time LUT in a photography sense, 
there are a couple really cool things that you can do, right? You've got the ability to take your photo, load it in, just have it all set up and, and you're good to go, and then do your edits to it. But how do you take an edit that you do here in Photoshop to a LUT in your camera, right? So I've got a couple actions here that I've just kind of like gone through and just played around with. So I'm going to throw one of these on here. Um, this is by no means a, a good looking look. In fact, that's actually not the one I wanted to select. So we will back this up and go back to start. Um, <laughs> so what you would do here is if I take, uh, I think it's this one. So I can take this look, right? I'm just going to run this action in uh, Photoshop here. And an action, for those that don't know, uh, if you don't work in Photoshop, an action just allows you to replicate an edit that you've done in the past by saving it in so that when you click on that, it just runs all the things that you've done. It's basically just macros. So with this, say I really like the way this image looks, right? Um, or in this case, I want to come in here. Let me go into Camera Raw real quick. I don't know if this is going to scale right. Nope, of course it's not. So you're only going to see part of my image here. So say we're looking at this right here and I want to bring up the uh, whites in my image. I want to bring my highlights back so I can actually kind of save them a bit. Uh, and then let's save that. And you'll see that that'll reflect in the image. And okay, cool. I brought my highlights back in this final image and we got it. Cool. But now... Okay, this is great. This is an edit that I did on my computer and, you know, what's the whole point? I would be doing this normally. Well, now, if I wanted to take this image and I wanted to bring this onto my S5 Mark II, I can now take this and from Photoshop kick out a LUT. I can kick out an actual uh, different precision lookup table for my camera to utilize. So the way you do this is you go under File, you see up here, we're going to go to export, and then you're going to go to color lookup tables. Now, the important thing about doing this is that you have to remember that you need to leave all of your uh, layers in Photoshop visible. Um, you can't flatten the image and then try to export a LUT. You want to leave all of these layers visible and active. Um, I only turned the overall sharpness one off because I know that that's something I'm going to talk about. That actually bugs out the system. Certain types of edits do not translate um, because this is, you know, we're using this more for photography. So, uh, so what you'll see here is you've got the description that you want to do for this. You have the grid points. So this would be the accuracy of it. So you set this to 33. And then in our case, I'm interested in a cube file, a .cube file, so .cube. So once I have this, just click OK. It'll open up uh, a file storage thing here. And then here's where I can save this out as the look I want. So let's save this as Tokyo Lights. And we'll save this as number two. So now all I do is just literally click Save. It runs the process, and it saves that look out as a .cube file that I can now load onto my camera. So what does this do? How does this look, right? So if I go to my camera here, the way you would do this for photography, because as you noticed, I did not photograph that image in Vlog. I photographed that image in standard color profile. So what I'm gonna do here is first, I'm gonna go into the settings menu. So if I go in here, you'll see this is the custom menu. So this would be the gear icon. And we have this new option called LUT library. So now I'm gonna go into my LUT library and I'll scroll all the way down to the bottom. You'll see I already have this preloaded on the camera, but what you would do is this particular LUT would be on the SD card. So we're going to, I'm not going to do that live here, but I have the, that file on my SD card. So we're going to go set 10, click in here, go to load, and we're going to go to my slot two. And we'll see here, I've got Tokyo lights. So now all I do is just click load Tokyo lights, reading LUT file completed. That is now in my 10 slots that I have for different looks that I can utilize. But now, what I will do here is in the photo sense, well, actually, I, I can do this in the video sense here. So in the video sense, I'm going to go into photo styles, and I'm going to go past like 2100, 
And I'm going to go to, let's say, this one here, right? So I know that my image was shot in standard, so I'm going to change the base color profile to standard. I'm going to come down. I know that I didn't have any of these other things changed with my particular look. And then I'm going to come down to LUT. This is the new option that you'll see. So we have lookup table right here. So I'm going to click on LUT select. And then we're going to scroll down here to Tokyo Lights. So now I can click on Tokyo Lights. And that now applies that look into this image. Now, clearly, this is one of the things that I purposely made sure this one kind of looks a little funky when you're working on the camera. Because just because you make an edit on your computer with the way you want it to look doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually going to come across as a good looking LUT, right? So in this case, this look, this editing style can work, but it works under fairly strict conditions, right? The way, if I go back to my Photoshop screen, the way this image looks with editing here, you'll see that it, it looks fine. It's very, very stylistic. I'm not saying that this is a, a great, super cool looking image, but it's a very stylistic look. And for this particular design, you know, it, it can work. It's, it's designed to be shot with in lower light, um, where you have a lot of artificial lighting and it can lean more into the tungsten range, that kind of thing. But this means that now, as I'm looking on my camera, I can be playing around with this. I don't really have a whole lot of room to move this. But I can play around with this, have this look actually saved out uh, in this particular case. We're going to save this to uh, this cyber one here. And now, I this is my look. This is the kind of way that I can set this up. And I know that if, hey, I'm in that particular shooting scenario, if I'm in low light, I'm doing long exposure of, say, a city that has a lot of neon lighting, I can set this up and know that, okay, that's my editing style for this, and that's how I want to shoot it. The cool part about this is that if you're someone who shoots JPEGs and RAW, this does not affect your RAW file. Your RAW file for stills is still going to be that base profile, so it'll still be a standard color profile RAW image that I can then take into Photoshop or any of the other programs and do my edits to. But that JPEG that comes out of the camera, or if you process a RAW in the camera, you can apply this look to it and know that, okay, cool, I've got my RAW file, I want to throw this LUT on it, that's how I want the image to look, and yeah, there you go, the camera's all set. You've got a super fast way to go from having to photograph and play around with the image in post to now I can actually photograph, see how the image is going to come out, and in my case, playing around with this 9 out of 10 times, that JPEG is going to be how I want it edited anyway. My raw file just is a backup if I want to change my edits again later. But we have multiples of these. So we also have in here, uh, in this case, I actually threw in a uh, different one here, which is to mimic Kodak, uh, different film Kodak stocks. Uh, I can also come in here and I can have this mimic kind of Kodachrome. Uh, which in this case, I'm going to shift my exposure here so it looks a little bit better. Uh, which gives me like an ultra crunchy look because it's closer to actually Kodachrome film. And all of this is done by basically going into a program like Photoshop, editing an image the way I want it, and then kicking out a LUT to put onto the SD card and load into the camera. So, uh, let uh, let me jump back through some of these questions and see what uh, what people have to say. Uh, you can show us how to generate LUTs. So we just did that. Uh, looks like Matt's got pretty good handle on there. Nick's here. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Nick, for jumping in as well. Uh, so going back and forth there. Uh, yeah. Okay. So one of the good points that, um, Nick brought up here is that if you are going to create your own LUTs and you want to load them on the camera, make sure that you're loading them in as 33 point. Um, so as we said here, uh, when I go into that generate a LUT from Photoshop, um, you'll see this selection right here, 33. Just make sure that that's set at 33 and the camera will be good to go. Uh, you'll be able to set that file in there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Ruckus, uh, any tip on squeezing the most light from a raw image in camera since the histogram or zebras do not represent raw dynamic range? I... Uh, 
this is actually so when it comes to working with any of these images right for raw uh typically if you want to get the maximum amount of dynamic range out of a raw file for stills I, I, there's a couple things because all of it's going to have to be done and processed off what the JPEG image image is going to look like. So you're bound by that a bit, but I have found that, uh, if I overexpose an image, you know, by like a stop, I've still got more than enough headroom, uh, to pull my highlights back. You will run into basically a brick wall of how much highlight you can pull back from an image. Right. Uh, and, and you see that when you do your editing. There is more dynamic range available in a photograph when you're just viewing it. Like if, if I'm standing on, you know, some of the streets that we were in, we were in Tokyo, there's more dynamic range that I can see than any of the cameras that you buy at all could ever reproduce at this current point in time. They can get close, but you're still going to have to make choices. You're going to either have to say, okay, I know I don't want my highlights blown out, but I don't want my shadows crushed all the way down into the basement as well. I, uh, so in a case like that, I shoot basically just trusting the camera's meter so that, Hey, I will set the camera up and I use kind of more visual look on it. So if I'm looking at an image, if I go to my camera here, so if I'm looking at this image here, and like I said, this has the Kodachrome look on it, uh, and Kodachrome is a very punchy, uh, file anyway, you'll see that if I use my luminance spot meter here, uh, my highlight is is definitely way up there. It's it's pretty much there's not really any kind of detail in there. It's 97% on a gray card. Uh, but if I turn the LUT off, you'll see that it's 88%. Uh, knowing that if you if you expose your image to basically where the the item that you want is properly exposed, you're still gonna have more than enough headroom to pull those highlights back. Um, if, if we take a look at this image here, you'll see if I come in here onto like this light here, uh, for, for a good example, if I come in and again, these are uh 16 bit, uh, TIFF files that I'm working with, uh, because I had to do some conversions for them. Uh, if I open up, uh, Adobe camera raw and I, I'll try to get this so that y'all can see it. Um, there we go. That actually looks like you can kind of see what I'm going to be doing here. Uh, you'll see that you, you have a couple different levels of control, but at some point it, it is gone. It just goes gray. Um, what, what I would recommend if you're super concerned about some of this stuff, uh, if you take an image, let me just uh, set my camera up here. So... If you take an image like this and click the display button, you get a different uh, playback view of the image. And I can come down here and see, okay, in this image, I have a ton of highlight space here. There is a ridiculous amount of highlight information still available. So I can actually lift this image a lot in the shadows and know that I'm not going to ever really worry about clipping any of my, um, my shadows there. While yes, this is still working in more of a you know, kind of JPEG engine, that's how your files are still going to be actually sent out. Um, you, you're still converting a raw file into either an 8-bit JPEG or, you know, a 16-bit a TIFF, depending on what it is you want to do. So you're not really limited by the camera's dynamic range that much, depending on where you want to put it. Uh, printing 16-bit TIFFs gives you the biggest dynamic range or the biggest range of color that you can reproduce. Uh, JPEGs are still only 8-bit, so, you know, you're kind of stuck at whatever a JPEG is going to give you. Um, HEIF files, if you're someone who is going to export something like this out as an HEIF file, uh, you can get 10-bit, so you get a little bit better gradation, but your dynamic range is still going to be limited to the display that you're going to be showing it on. So, I wouldn't worry too much, Ruckus. Uh, I think it was Ruckus that asked that question. Um, I wouldn't really worry too much about it. Um, histogram... Use it as a, as a general guideline. If you're not clipping anything in, in the histogram, you know that you're not going to clip anything uh, in the raw file. Uh, and then at that point, just kind of maybe shift it up a little bit brighter. I personally actually tend to underexpose a lot of my images. I like contrast in my photos. So it's just kind of, you just kind of have to play around with your particular style um, for that part. 
Um, let's see here. Uh, here's, uh, thanks for the great LUT generation demo. Beautiful possibilities. Technical quality of the stream is good now. Okay, good. Yeah, I, there hasn't, I, my stream's been going out at 30,000 kilobit, so 30 megabit per second, so nothing's really dropped on this end. If anything, it's probably on YouTube's side. Um, let's see here. Some of the other questions here. Uh, thank you for confirming about the Vericam LUTs. Not much info on HDR to find out there. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, cool. So, um, basically, you know, when we start kind of figuring out, you know, what you want to do with how, how the S5 Mark II is going to work for you when it comes to working with LUTs, um, we've built in so many pretty much ways that, that this can be customized for your particular style of shooting, right? I showed you the real-time LUT, which is just the basic real-time LUT function, which is always going to be based on Vlog, and then the My Photo Styles options. But what's cool about this is if we go back into my camera here, we have so many more options when it comes to photo styles that a lot of times people don't necessarily realize that we have. So by default, when you first get your camera, you're going to see that there's probably only going to be four My Photo Styles shown on the camera. Well, there's actually a lot more in here. Uh, so if we go in, and I realize I just absentmindedly did that without you guys knowing what I'm doing. So I go into the uh, custom menu here. So again, the gear. I go into the image quality page one, and I go into photo style settings. So from here, I can now go into here and say, show and hide different photo styles. So if you're someone who never uses, say, like, the flat profile, uh, if you never use L Classic Neo, if you never use, uh, say, L Monochrome, you know, whatever, any kind of combination that you want to work with. Say there are ones that you never use, you can turn them off so that they're not cluttering your display. It can make things move a little bit faster for you if you're cycling through these systems. But you'll also notice that as I scroll down here, you have like 2100 HLG. So that's the actual standardized like 2100 hybrid log gamma. And then because a lot of people wanted to do editing with HLG, you wanted to take this, bring it into software and do some editing with it. We have also added in an HLG full range option here, which gives you the full luminance range for HLG capture. Um, you would not want to use this as a direct to deliver format, you're going to use HLG full range for the purpose of editing, uh, but that is in the camera and that's kind of hidden. But you'll see that because I've renamed them, I have Kodak 1, Kodachrome, Cinegam, Cyber, but I also have 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are all hidden here. This allows me to come in and actually turn all of these on if I wanted to have 10 separate looks that I want to have saved into the camera, uh, so that no matter what, I have, you know, full access to the full color choice that I want to work with. So now if I come back and I look at photo styles, you'll see when I go past cyber, photo style 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10. So each of these can be fully customized just like we did before. Not just for using things like the um, uh, LUTs, you still have full general control over this. Uh, FC asked a question, uh, besides Photoshop, can SilkyPix also ex export LUT cube files? Not that I am aware of. I have not seen um, Photoshop or uh, SilkyPix be able to do this. This is something that I know has been built into Photoshop. Um, and even on some other looking to, I've not been able to find this in Lightroom either. So this, my demonstration for it is strictly in Photoshop. Um, but going back to looking at the different photo styles, some of the other cool things that you have control over here, since everyone always likes to customize your camera, you like to make it so that it's easy for you to access and easy for you to function with and not have to think about too much. You know, this is how you like to shoot. This is the scenario that you work with. This is the color profile you want to work with. We also have the ability to come in here to the my photo style settings and add two effects that are off by default. So these two settings would be sensitivity and white balance. So what does this do for me, right? So if I come in here and I go back up to video and I go into photo styles and say I'm looking at 
my uh, Kod the Kodachrome look that I have in here. When I scroll down, you'll see that I can tell the camera in this color profile, in this particular one that I've created, I want my ISO to stick to a very specific number. So in this case, because say I'm standard, say I want this to always stick to 640. Uh, so 640 ISO. And I know that this look is always based on the use in tungsten lighting. Because, say, that's just how I'm setting it up to shoot with. Uh, or because I'm using the Kodachrome, let's say that I have this set for daylight. I can also come in here and say, well, how do I want my ISO range to work? Do I want it in auto, low, or high? So let's change this to low. This way I can scroll over and say, okay, I want the low range, which would be 100 uh, when you're in the standard photo styles. Or I can come up here, go to high, and know that, okay, my high range is 640. That's the native ISO in that. Cool. There we go. This Now this photo style, when I click display, save the current settings, and I save this over my Kodachrome look, now what this means is that any time I cycle through from this, which we'll see now I've got auto ISO, I've got f2.8, and I'm using one of the different looks. So this is the Kodak look. I can cycle, turn it on and off, say, okay, this is with a LUT, this is it with it off. Cool. But now if I come in here and I go to my 2, which is my Kodachrome look, my ISO is automatically set to 640. And my white balance, if you look in the top left, my white balance is automatically set to daylight. This makes it so, so simple to have looks that are designed based on a certain ISO that you shoot with and a certain uh, white balance that you work with. So if you're someone that's looking to make this camera set up so that, hey, I know that when I go out at night and I'm photographing cityscapes, I know that the lighting is always going to be, you know, I always want to be using tungsten lighting. I always want to be using, you know, my base ISOs. So in this case, I want to set it for 640. And I know that I want to apply this look onto that image because that's how my editing looks. That's all the settings that I use for this. Boom, set it up, save it into that. And no matter what, when I go back into my actual settings, when I go into my photo styles, it is by default now set that, it, I'm going to be using high dual range, ISO 640, my white balance is set there, and then I can turn my LUT on and cool, we're golden. Obviously, in this particular scenario, you know, I'm, I'm in the video set. So if I take this and I go to my photo mode, see so you get very little, you know, very different looking image here uh, because I am have to change to my Kodachrome look. My Kodachrome look, what's... What you have to remember about this is I was setting all of that stuff up in the video mode, right? So those were my video photo styles. So that means that now when I come in here, my ISO is set in high. Um, my white balance is not set up in, in how I want it to. So now if I come into the photo options and go back up to photo styles, you'll see if I go down and scroll down into Kodachrome, you'll see that these are different. So now I want to change this from high. I want to change this to 640. I want to change this back to daylight. And then I want to save this, save current setting, go to Chrome. Now, whether or not I change from photo to video, that photo style is now set to be in 640 ISO, and it's set to be with that look that I've applied to it. Uh, let's see what other kind of questions we've got here. Uh, I have the Panasonic BGH-1. Is there a way to make ND filters in the settings? Uh, no, not on the um, BGH-1 or the BS-1H. Uh, in order for ND filters to be built into a product, um, size is still an issue that everyone deals with. Uh, cameras either have to be much bigger because you either have to move a contemporary piece of glass out of the way, which means you need storage space for it that's the same size as the sensor mount, uh, or you're using something that's going to be permanently fixed in the optic path, which reduces light transmission, which means that your ISOs have to typically be higher. Um, so that's why cameras like the BGH-1 and the BS-1H do not have built-in ND filters. Uh, let's see here. What other kind of questions? Um, as we were saying, if you have questions for the stream, uh, drop them in the chat by tagging at LumixUSA, uh, and we can get to them while we're 
uh, broadcasting live. Uh, but it looks like Matt and Nick have been doing a great job uh, supporting some of the questions there. Um... Yeah, looks like you guys have been doing a really good job uh, getting the uh, questions there. Um, okay, so one of the other kind of things that I wanted to you know mention about this because we were saying that you know when I'm looking at the camera here and we go in with the photo styles that you have all of this extra kind of control is that you're not just limited to you know kind of these funky edits that you want to do. So if I say I'm in Photoshop and say, I just want to take this image and say, I just want to do my general editing, right? I just want to be able to come in here and just edit, create a lot. The first thing that you're going to want to do is actually have this image opened up as a standard file in Photoshop and you want to edit based on layers. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go in and say, let's add a curves layer. So now I can play around with these curves. Let's readjust this just a little bit so y'all can see it. So say I just want to add some simple S curve, which is a very dramatic, excuse me, a very dramatic S curve. Say I want to come in here and I want to add a, uh, let's add a photo filter onto this. Let's add a cooling filter. So we'll go cooling. So we'll get a little bit cooler of a look there. And then let's do another layer. Let's throw on, let's throw on a color balance. Let's just shift some of this stuff around and kind of just make it look funky, right? So standard editing, nothing really like super special with this. This isn't really anything that like you would be doing to go overly crazy. These are just ways that say, hey, this is how I like to edit my photos. This is how I like the way uh, this image looks. If you're someone who does um, channel swapping, so say I want to uh, channel swap blue and red. So I can come in here. I can go, uh, let's change my uh, looks here. So now I've swapped the blue and the red channels. So you get these kind of like this really weird funky thing. If anyone's done infrared photography, this is one of the things you can do in infrared photography to change this. So say, okay, cool. Like that's, that's, you know, kind of a look that I want to go with on this or say, I really don't want that channel swap. I just want this to stay the way it is. You have that again, you go in, you export this out as a look, but say you want to take this particular image and you want to work with it with this image and you want to actually apply a look that you've already got. So I would go into here, go to color lookup. And here I can load LUT files onto here. So I can just take an image and say, hey, you know, there's that look that I have. I have it stored. I'm on a different computer. I want to take this image and I want to throw it on there. Cool. Now my lookup is added to it. This is also one of the ways that you can take, if you have a specific video look that you already know exists, you can apply that to the footage here in Photoshop. You can then layer it out, do some of the edit that you want on that file. So I can say, okay, hey, look, I like the way this looks, but it's still a little maybe too dark for me. I can come in here, go to layers. I can add a, add a let's just add a brightness layer onto this here. So I can increase the brightness a little bit because with that look, I'm not super happy with how, how that particularly, you know, kind of crushes everything down. I'm okay with the highlights blowing, but I just want a little bit more detail in that shadow region there. Uh, you can even come in and do uh, uh, Adobe Camera Raw uh, edit to this, but I want to come in. Let's uh, change my curves a little bit. Let's uh, bring my shadows up just a wee bit more. Let's bring those highlights back down so that you get a little bit more of that crushed look. So we're doing an inverse S curve on this. So say, okay, now this is the way I want it to look. I started in this case with a lookup table. So I started with a look that I already know that say, hey, I liked, but I want to edit it a little bit for this type of exposure. And then again, I can just come in here, go here, export, color lookup table, change this out and just do updated Kodachrome. And then cool. That's my style. 
that's the look that I had. All right, let's see some of these other questions here. Um, is high-res electronic shutter shot 12-bit or 14-bit? Just wondering. Um, I have to double check on that one. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's still 14-bit. Um, should still be 14-bit. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll uh, check on that one for you, DJ. Um, Harry, love shooting black and white. Could I have the benefit uh, with LUT possibilities of the S5 II? Yes, 100% you can. So if we go back in and we're looking at, um, you know, the Photoshop setup here. So say I want to go in here and I don't want to use, I want to take this look off, but say I want to take this image and I edit typically where, you know, I want to come in here, go to adjustment layer, and I want to do a black and white conversion on this. So cool, I've got my black and white, but I want to play around with the actual tonality of this. So I want to have, you know, maybe like super vibrant, you know, yellows. I want to have vibrant reds. Let's bring, it's not a lot of green in this one. So let's play around with that. Uh, let's shift the cyans. So let's go to like a really dark sky. Uh, and then the blues, let's play around with the blues a little bit more. And then our magenta, not really doing too much. It's doing it on the crane there. So say, okay, cool. This is the look I wanted. That's, that's the black and white look that I want for this. Well, it's the same thing. I just come in here, generate out a LUT, make sure again that it's 33 point, save it in, and then let's do uh, night, black and white, actually, PNW. So night, black and white. Let's save this out. Cool, we've got it. So now I'm going to go to my camera. I'm gonna take my SD card. And uh, for those that wanna do this and you wanna be loading LUTs onto your S5 Mark II, uh, you wanna make sure that depending on what kind of LUT you wanna put on the camera, uh, you use the proper card for it. Um, don't use SDHC media cards. Those are typically gonna be 32 gig cards and lower. Uh, you'll see it'll actually say SDHC on the card. Uh, the reason you don't want to use those is that you are limited to eight characters for the name. Um, it's part of just the way an SDHC card or a FAT32 system writes versus an XFAT system. It's a character limitation because of the file structure. So when you're going to be doing this, make sure you're using an SDXC memory card, especially if you're using cube files. You can name them much, much longer uh, up to 255 characters with the .cube extension uh, when you use those cards. So let's put this card into my computer. Uh, let's take this here. Uh, let's go back to here. So we're looking at my, uh, my image here. Uh, let us go into where did I save that file? That would be helpful, wouldn't it? So let's go export, color lookup. And I save this under D ProBlade LUT files. So let's go D, LUT files, there we go. So now we're looking at these LUT files, right? And we'll see that I have the updated Kodachrome one that I just created. And then I also should have in here, night BNW cube. So we're going to copy those. We're going to go to my uh, memory card. Let's clear some space to make it cleaner. We're gonna paste those into the card itself. And these files should be small. They should be around nine, uh, 900 kilobyte, you know, right around that range. We're going to eject the card. So it takes it out. Take the card. Loading this into slot two on my S5 Mark II. Going to go to my camera. And now what we're going to do is go, just like we said before, go down to custom, go to LUT library. And in this case, I'm going to replace one of mine because I have all 10 already uh, kind of processed here. So let's go, let's delete this one. Uh, the cool thing is you, you don't have to delete it. You can just load one on top of it. And basically that just erases the old one and puts the new one in place. So I'm going to go into this. I know that I've had them on set two. So let's load uh, B&W. Now, uh, since I am still in the uh, photography mode, I'm gonna go to the photo menu, go to photo styles, 
And let's go up here and change. Oh, let's go up to the top and we're going to go and go into my photo style five. So this was based on standard and scroll down. We're going to leave uh, the ISO and the white balance settings on auto for this particular setup. Now I'm going to go to this look here and we're going to scroll down and night black and white. So now we'll save this by clicking the display set button, go here, uh, go into my photo style five. Now the cool thing here is that you can also click display again and I can rename this file now. So let's rename this black and white, set this, save it there. And now I've created my own black and white look for photography by doing this LUT performance or this LUT process. So while this has been such a big tool for videographers, as you can see with the conversation between Matt and Nick, photographer, uh, the videographers across the board have been working with LUTs for such a long time, varying different styles of LUTs, different ways that you would work with them. Photography, this is a relatively new-ish kind of idea. But like I said, we've been using a lookup table for quite some time now in photography. When you go into a program like Adobe Camera Raw and you pick camera profile, those are pretty much just LUTs. Those are lookup tables to say this is how the image is. This is the raw data of the image. This is what red should look like. This is what blue should look like apply that and then convert it to those looks. You do also have the ability that any of these LUTs that you've created or whatever, you can import them in so that in Photoshop and in Lightroom, they actually show up as profiles that you can work with. Uh, but this makes it super easy for anyone that wants to work both photography and videography to have a unified system that gives you a much faster way to output results that save you time from having to go into the computer. You edit an image once, you edit a look once, export it out, load it into the camera. And like you said, we've got 10 in camera. Uh, Matt and I used to joke when we first came out with this that, you know, 10 might be overkill. In fact, during the launch video, we were like, you know, maybe 10 slots, you may be looking at that saying, well, why would you ever want 10, you know, particular lookup tables in the camera? Well, Seeing what some people are doing with this and some of the communities online, you see that now you've got crazy flexibility and you can constantly just keep loading and unloading these however you want them to change the way you work so that you're not having to spend as much time behind the computer. You can be out there creating and, and just delivering without really spending too much time planted in one place like this. All right, let's see here. Um, we've got a couple more seconds uh, or a couple more minutes that I have uh, so I can address a couple more questions uh, if they haven't been gotten to yet. Uh, FC says, can multiple LUTs be overlaid uh, like layers in camera? Uh, not in camera. Uh, it's going to be one LUT uh, loaded at a time. Uh, but what you could do is load LUTs into Lightroom just like you would or, uh, in Photoshop, just like I was showing before. Um, because I can come in here and say, okay, hey, you know, I like the black and white uh, look here. Uh, let's add an adjustment layer. Let's add a color lookup table to this. Let's say I want to add my Tokyo Lights look on top of that. And then come in, do another layer, new adjustment layer, another lookup layer on this. Go in here and then say updated Kodachrome, say, right? So yeah, you, you can layer them in this in Photoshop and then kick this look out uh, just like we did before because Photoshop only looks at the different layers and how they are interpreting on top of an image. So you can do layered LUTs. You just have to create it as layers in Photoshop and then kick out one master LUT. Um, and that would include everything that you've done to that image. Uh, as a lookup table on on the camera. So it's still going to be one LUT, but it would be encompassing all the other looks that you end up creating. So I hope that helped. Uh, cool. All right, let's see if we had any other questions before we wrap up for today. Um, combining LUTs can be uh, performed with LUT software. Yep. Uh, if you're looking at it from a photography perspective, you can, do, this is something you can do in Photoshop, or if you're someone who works, uh, um, 
much more like in the video side there are video tools for all of this uh, but because like if you've been watching Lumix Live for a while I I come at this more from the photography perspective and we're going to do another LUT stream uh, specifically and actually that Matt and Nick are both in the chat I'd love to have both of them on and actually talk about this but very heavy from people that know what they're talking about from the video side uh, there are so many ways to get into this now and knowing that a number of people work in Photoshop that is like the primary tool that the vast majority of photographers work with still. Knowing that you have this, this tool at your disposal, now that can be loaded right into your S5 Mark II, just gives you that much more control over what you want to do with it. You're not limited to have to just, you know, rely on whatever the camera has and then spend all the time in Photoshop or whatever to do it. Um, the cool thing, I, another cool thing, is obviously there's a lot of cool things with this, is that you're also seeing um, a lot of the photographers out there that have been making presets for things like Lightroom and Photoshop are now starting to actually convert those presets that they've been making for Photoshop and Lightroom into LUT files. So that now, you know, say you're someone who grew up and you loved shooting on Provia or Velvia for photography. Like those were the films that you used. Or like when I went through school, I started shooting on Ilford 6400 black and white film. I can now take those looks that have been generated for photography, kick them out as LUTs, load them onto the camera, and apply them both for my photography and my videography. So if I know I'm doing hyper, you know, stylized video work, cool. I can just throw this in, set it up, get a look, and we're good to go. Uh, the one thing that I didn't mention uh, with this whole setup, and this will be the last kind of thing that I want to mention here, is... When we have all these different photo styles, like we said, we've got standard, vivid, natural, L classic, neo, some of these different looks. You can also build even further on this. So right now I've got that black and white look that I applied on here, but say I want to have this one based on L classic neo, I can also come down here and I can actually add grain effect onto this. So say I want to add say standard grain and I don't want to add color noise onto this because it's a black and white image. So now if I save this out, let's uh, save this in the current setting here. So now if I take a still image here, so we've got that image and I go into playback, I now have an image that also has a grain effect added to it that mimics actual film. So I don't have to necessarily go in there and say, you know, I want to go into post and add film grain to it. We can do that in the camera as well. These are all just tools that you have to customize the look for your camera. Uh, let's see here. Uh, FC, I wonder if photographers are adding their own watermarks or logos into LUTs. Uh, that's, it's an interesting idea, but you can't. Uh, a lookup table is literally just interpreting data. You, it's not an image or anything that's laying over top of your image that you're working with. It is literally just interpreting ones and zeros to be different ones and zeros. So you, it's not something that you can like put a watermark on and then everyone that uses it, there's a watermark on it. So yeah, that's kind of how that part works. But yeah, uh, DJ says, any experience using false color LUT for exposure? Uh, I would actually turn that one over to Nick Driftwood. Uh, Nick has a really cool false color uh, LUT available. So definitely take a look there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, cool. All right. Well, thank you all so much for jumping in. I know this one was uh, a, a bit of a different kind of stream because um, I talked a lot about going through this and um, I'm super thankful that we had Nick and Matt in the chat because you guys were able to help address a lot of the questions while we were going through the demonstrations here. Uh, but I encourage you all, if you've got an S5 Mark II, start playing around with LUTs. Uh, go into Photoshop. I will, you know, we've got the walkthrough on here on how to do it. Uh, and full transparency, I learned this through YouTube, just pulling up, hey, what is a LUT? How do I work with it? And how can I do this in Photoshop? Uh, in fact, actually, I want to give a shout out to the page that I actually used uh, for this because um, I, I don't like using something and not giving the credit where it was. Um, so I used uh, Photoshop Cafe, uh, Colin Smith, uh, who I've met, I've met before years ago. Um, talking about, you know, transforming uh, your photos with LUTs in Photoshop. This is, this is a really cool walkthrough if you want to use Photoshop to apply LUTs into. 
and then go from here and take that information on how to make your own looks to then output uh, into your camera or uh, even if you want to use these in different programs. Um, he had a really a really cool walkthrough on how to utilize LUTs in Photoshop, how to get them in there. So I encourage you to go take a look uh, at some of the stuff that Colin's done. Uh, and yeah, uh, so with that, thank you everybody for tuning in, uh, jumping in with us. Uh, this was, like I said, a very different stream than I think I've done in the past. Uh, there's a lot more talking on my side, not a whole lot of questions that I was answering there. Um, and yeah, if you liked, uh, this video, if you liked the conversation, the information that you got, um, give us a like, uh, give us thumbs up, all that kind of fun stuff on the channel. It helps me grow this and be able to find out what content people actually want to see and what content people don't ever want to see again. Uh, so if this is something you liked, uh, definitely give us a like. Uh, if you know someone who's been talking about wanting to play around with this stuff, share the videos of them. Let them uh, know about what these cameras can do. These are fun new tools that we have at, at our uh, disposal that we've never really had before. Um, outside of that, I will be back live again next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time with actually a really fun thing to talk about. Um, I got a uh, shipment from Sigma that I know a lot of people were asking about on the S5 Mark II, and that is the Sigma 60 to 600 millimeter for L mount. Uh, so I just got this lens. Uh, I'm gonna start doing uh, some stuff this weekend now that we're out of the rain and the cold down here in Austin. Uh, so I'm gonna give you my thoughts on this and some of the cool things to to work with, and uh, you know maybe some things to keep an eye out for when you're working with a lens like this. But um, yeah, we got a cool lens to play around with uh, that we will be talking about next Thursday. Um, what else? Um, yeah, outside of that, again, thanks, everybody. We will be back next Thursday, 2 p.m. I uh, hope you all have a great rest of your weekend, rest of your day. Uh, and if you are if you come up with cool looks for your camera, share them out. Let us know what, what kind of looks you've come up with. Um, it's a cool area to play around with, and I think a lot of people uh, will benefit from seeing and playing around with real-time LUTs. So outside of that, take care, everybody.